Buonasera, siamo felici di trasmettere nell'ambito del progetto espositivo tre stazioni per tre scienze in corso presso il Palazzo delle Esposizioni di Roma, il primo di una serie di incontri dedicati alla matematica e realizzati in collaborazione con l'Istituto per le Applicazioni del Calcolo Mauro Picone del CNR, di cui il professor Roberto Natalini, che introdurrà questa sera la professoressa Ingrid Besci, è l'attuale direttore. Um, voglio brevemente ricordare che sotto il titolo unitario di tre stazioni per arte e scienza uh, è condotto una, un ampio progetto che vede tre mostre che rappresentano tre punti di vista uh, di dialogo tra arte e scienza, il punto di vista storico, la scienza di Roma, passato e presente e futuro di una città, il punto di vista squisitamente artistico, T con zero e quello della ricerca scientifica contemporanea rappresentato dalla mostra incertezza, interpretare il presente e prevedere il futuro. La rassegna è promossa da Roma Culture, è stata ideata e organizzata dall'azienda speciale Pala Expo in collaborazione con numerose istituzioni, tra, quali, tra le quali l'INFN, l'Istituto di Fisica Nucleare, a cui si deve l'intera progettazione e curatela della mostra incertezza, mentre l'esposizione La scienza di Roma è stata patrocinata dall'Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei e dalla Sapienza Università di Roma e che ha anche collaborato alla sua realizzazione. Vi ricordo brevemente che questo è il primo incontro che ha per protagonista Ingrid Dubesci, titolato Arte e Matematica, interconnesse in molteplici modi, è il primo di una serie. Giovedì 13 alle 18.30 in presenza qui all'interno del palazzo, all'interno della rotonda, Uh, ci sarà un incontro sempre con Roberto Natalini, Cesare Pietro Iusti e, Cla e Chiara Valerio intitolato Linguaggio, Linguaggi tra arte matematica e vita quotidiana. Il 20 di gennaio Michel Audin uh, condurrà un incontro molto interessante su, uh, dedicato ad Italo Calvino intitolato Ritratto di Italo Calvino come geometra e infine lunedì 31 gennaio avremo la medaglia Filz Alessio Figalli in conversazione con Roberta Fulci. A questo proposito io ri voglio ringraziare il professor Natalini per aver collaborato a questo progetto e a lui passo la parola per introdurre la professoressa Dubesci. Allora, grazie Francesca, Tanto, eh, grazie soprattutto per aver organizzato questa presentazione in questo ambiente bellissimo. Vedete, abbiamo delle stupende opere d'arte che tutti quanti eh, immagino dovresti vedere, che connettono molto bene il mondo della scienza con il mondo dell'arte. E questa mostra di con zero è veramente um, sorprendente per alcuni versi e, e penso che chiunque sia interessato alla scienza, alla matematica e anche all'arte eh, può trovare delle suggestioni importanti venendo a vederla. È ancora aperta per un po', almeno fino alla fine di febbraio, credo, no? Quindi abbiamo ancora tempo e quindi anche se c'è questa pandemia l'accesso è aperto, è tutto in sicurezza, quindi insomma vi invito a venire a vedere. Oggi abbiamo ospite eh, dagli Stati Uniti, eh, Ingrid Dobesci, eh, anzi la baronessa Ingrid Dobesci perché ha questo <ride> titolo e che è una, eh, chiaramente una matematica, una fisica tra le più famose al mondo. Um, inizialmente ha preso un dottorato in fisica teorica però poi si è mossa verso le applicazioni della matematica e, e ha fatto un percorso abbastanza particolare perché ha cominciato con una carriera universitaria in varie università però poi uh, nell'87 eh, è andata nei Bell Laboratories eh, negli Stati Uniti dove eh, ha cominciato a lavorare proprio su uh, questi uh, questi risultati che l'hanno resa famosa sulla compressione di immagini, la compressione di segnali, eh, che hanno dato luogo a questi lavori che sono ormai famosissimi, no? sulle wavelets, eh, c'è la base di wavelets di Dobesci, eh, la base or biortogonale, che hanno poi dato luogo a applicazioni importanti, tra cui in particolare ricordiamo lo standard JPEG 2000, che insomma è ormai di uso comune. Um, poi è tornata all'università, eh, è stata prima alla Rutgers University, poi a Princeton a partire dal 1994 ed è stata la prima donna a essere 
full professor all'Università di Princeton in matematica. Attualmente è professoressa alla Duke University, è membro di tantissime accademie, è difficile ricordarle tutte, ma sicuramente il National Academy of Science e l'Academy American Academy of Arts and Science, è stata la prima donna a essere presidente della International Mathematical Union dal 2011 al 2014. Uh, ha lavorato su tantissime cose, su applicazioni non soltanto a, al trattamento del segnale, ma alle immagini biomediche, alle immagini del cervello, alla geofisica, alla morfologia biologica e alla conservazione dell'arte, all'analisi di, di una serie di, di tecniche usate in conservazione dell'arte. Uh, ultimamente, uh, durante la pandemia, si è dedicata, e oggi ce ne parlerà verso la fine di questa, di questa eh, presentazione, eh, con altri matematici e artisti, a creare un sito, un sito di un'installazione di arte che potete andare tutti a vedere, è matemalchemy.org, che è un sito online che, appunto, di cui parlerà verso la fine, quindi qualcosa forse vi farà anche vedere. Io penso che mi posso fermare qui, So, Ingrid, you can start your, your talk. Thank you very well, much for being thank here. You, thank you so very much for this introduction and this opportunity to speak. So, as you uh, heard, I will talk about uh, two different aspects, really. On the one hand, I will uh, mention uh, uh, art and uh, how we help art historians and uh, 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 conservators uh, with mathematics. On the other hand, uh, I will, at the end, I hope still have a little bit of time to talk to you about mathematics, a completely different linking of mathematics and art. But let me start with the first part. So uh, let me share my screen here and uh, go to presentation so that we, we can see here. So, uh, And I don't want to start by, I don't want to give the impression that I'm the only one doing this. So I'll actually give you several examples, one of which the last one will be my own, but earlier work will review uh, results of Massimo Fornasier, who is now in, 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 uh, in, in Munich, in, in, uh, in Germany, and work by Rick Johnson. And then I'll start about some work in which I was involved. So. The work of Massimo Fornasier, it dates back, uh, uh, oh, oh, 25 years now, but it really started, it was a, a, a project on uh, reconstructing destroyed frescoes. So the Eremitani church in Padua, uh, at the end of the Second World War, looked like this, because there had been a bombing mistake, it had been mistaken for a military target, and beautiful frescoes that existed there and that you see here, the kind of reconstruction, old reconstruction, they're not much nicer ones that I'll show you later, uh, were reduced to this kind of rubble. They were, they were collected after the bombing and for many decades they sat in uh, uh, conservation ateliers and it seemed hopeless. Then at the, in the 90s, computers had progressed enough, even though a supercomputer then could do less than your phone can do now. Still, they had progressed enough that it was deemed possible to make a reconstruction digitally. So all the fresh fragments were digitized and photographed in high resolution and they were put on CD-ROMs. Do you remember those? The youngest one among you may not even remember that there was such an item as CD-ROMs. Anyway, you could get them and they asked for proposals to uh, uh, reconstruct everything. Um, and then it was a big problem because there was an enormous number of fragments. The total surface they covered was enormous. I mean, 77 square meters, but even that was only part of the whole area that needed to be covered. It was maybe at most 10% less than that. Uh, so it was like having to do a gigantic uh, uh, puzzle 
of which you had lost 90% of the pieces and then still try to put everything on the same, on the right spot. But the puzzle pieces would be completely irregular. Not only did you not know where to put them, you also didn't know in what orientation to put them. So a method was needed to place these fragments. And that's what Massima Fornazier and, uh, uh, came up with a solution to do this. So how do you digitize images? Well, what you do is you divide it in very, very tiny little pieces, uh, which you call pixels. Here I'm thinking of a black and white image, but in general, of course, you have to do this in color. So in red, green, and blue. But you take you enlarge, 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 and then when you keep enlarging, every little tiny pixel just has one uniform level of gray or one uniform color. And that is then characterized by a number from zero, which is all black, to 255, which is all white. Uh, so can, can we, uh, so you have all these images given by their numbers. How do you compare images? Well, you say, I look at the table of numbers and I compare whether they are the same. But of course, it's not that easy. Look at these two rotated images. They correspond, a little piece of image in there corresponds to completely different numbers. You can't recognize that one is a rotated version of the other, not at first. So how are you going to deal with all those fragments? that are rotated. Well, Massimo for, uh, proposed to uh, uh, use circular harmonics. Those are very, very special images, which are shown here, that have a very beautiful mathematical property. You can decompose anything in them. So here, I take this little face at the bottom right, and I show you how by superposing these images, these circular harmonics that we saw earlier, by adding the right amount of each, gradually we build up a little image. And so that could be done for uh, uh, every one of the images that was given on, on, on the little rubble thing, and we'll come back to that. But the beautiful thing is that if you decompose an image in such a combination, then you can compute immediately what the number should be for a similar decomposition of a rotated version. So you have rotation numbers that depend only on the angle by which you rotate it. So what that meant is you can scan one thing and then you can immediately find all the different ways in which you would have to put it for different angles. And that mean, meant that they could uh, imagine doing a project. And so you see how long ago this is. This is a time when terminals were these big things, these big machines with a big uh, uh, tube behind it. And people from different uh, branches would come and be volunteers and work at projects where they would retrieve something from uh, 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 the library. They would put on the biggest possible circle that could fit they would do the decomposition of that piece. And that would then be compared with the right rotation numbers with a, a library of, of these pieces. And it would give you the best possible matches. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, the, among the three possible best matches was already the right one. And so in order to do that, we're talking about 25 years ago, remember? Uh, uh, well, 20 years now. Uh, they were not so, no, no artificial learning had not progressed as much as it has now. So people were the best judges of what the right solution was. And then it could be put in place on, on the big uh, uh, box of, of the puzzle. So here you see for one of the frescoes, they did have black and white pictures of that they could adjust to exactly the, the uh, life size of, of the frescoes before bombing had happened. So they had in a sense, a template in black and white, but they can put all these little pieces of this fresco and look how beautiful it corresponds. 
This is a little uh, fragment. On the right, you see what fragment it is and where it has been put in. And here's another one and another one. Now you might say, what good is this? Well, they only had black and white pictures before. With this information, you can reconstruct because you now know the skin tone. You know the color of the lance. You know the back of the shield. You know the color of the leather wrapping of these sandals. You know the color of the stones. You can reconstruct the whole image with this information. And that's what was done. Actually, in the church, uh, uh, the choice was made to recreate big patches in pastel color to make the contrast with those are the true pieces and those are what we repainted. And here you see uh, when it was still being uh, redecorated in, 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 in Padua. Uh, but you could also, and that's another thing, you could do this mathematically. I mean, what you'd want to art conservator does in order to spread the color is to just take color and then spread it out a little bit and a little bit more and so on. And that you can do mathematically with equations. So you can spread it a bit. Well, here we've just put in place what we have, but we spread a bit and a bit more and a bit more and you can fill in. This is called in painting, which is something that is really useful and used in many, many applications. And so what this means is that you could also imagine going to the church and holding your, your smartphone over it and click and get what the color, reconstructed color should have been. So that was a first application about which I wanted to tell you, which is actually a really beautiful one and for which Massimo Fournazier got a, a big deal prize from the International uh, uh, Congress of Industrial and Applied Mathematics uh, some years ago. Okay, next, I'd like to tell you about a different application. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, Automatic thread counting for paintings on canvas. Okay, so this is a painting by Van Gogh. And uh, one of the first projects on which I started working was with the Van Gogh Museum, as did Rick Johnson. And the application I'm going to talk to you about is completely serendipitous because we were working on completely different issues. But as part of that, they gave us uh, insight in looking at x-rays of these paintings. And here you see an x-ray of that painting. And something that's very striking uh, is that you actually can see the threads of the weave of the canvas. And that might seem surprising at first, because how come you can see canvas weave when we well know that x-rays go straight through textile? Well, it's not the canvas that you see, but the primer that's applied to the canvas. Canvas has a weave with all these, uh, uh, so canvas has a weave with all these threads. And in order for the canvas not to absorb paint too much, a layer of primer is applied to it, a white layer that makes it less absorbing. That white layer, until recently, and certainly still in the 19th century, was something that used lead white. Lead white, and of course, since you have all these valleys and hills, in the valleys, a little bit more of the, the, the primer stays than on top of the hills. And so you have a thicker layer, thinner layer, thicker layer, thinner, and so on. And so lead, of course, is very absorbent of x-rays. And that's why when you take an x-ray of these, these pictures, you start uh, seeing the canvas through. You just see the, 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 the lead white thickness. And if you blow it up, then you really start to see individual threads. Here I look at one blow up and it's negative. I mean, usually people find it nicer to look at a negative of it. Um, and, and so one thing that conservators did was count threads in order to characterize the canvas. And then we said, well, but that's maybe something that can be done automatically using 
uh, uh, tools from what's called Fourier transform that give you how frequently do does something that repeats regularly occur and, and so on. And so an analysis was done. And uh, uh, with students, uh, uh, Rick Johnson developed a tool. Uh, I'm going to show you what that tool gives on a different painting by Van Gogh, but here you see x-rays of the, 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 the threads in that painting. And you, you see, you have a weave. The weave is not completely horizontal or completely vertical in places because sometimes the, the, the fabric had not been pulled completely horizontal and vertical taut before it was primed. And once it's primed, you cannot really fidget with it very much. Also, the weave is not always completely regular. We're talking 19th century, still handwoven fabrics here. Um, Okay, so probably handwoven. Um, what happens is that uh, uh, they decided to make the information visual by means of a color code. So if you look at horizontal threads, then what happens is that at some layers, you'll find a few more threads than at others. So if the threads are a bit more frequent, they are thinner threads, then you have a number of 13 threads per inch. And a bit higher, you might have only 12 threads per inch and so on. And in order to visualize that information, they use the color code. Also, the threads might not be completely horizontal. They might deviate a little bit in angle. And again, they use the color code for that. One color for horizontal, and then for every degree that you were different, a slightly different color. So that, if I share my screen again, gives rise to the information that uh, here, I'm showing you the frequency here in one direction, the horizontal direction. And I'm showing the deviation from true vertical in the vertical direction. In practice, they made four, one about frequency and angle horizontally and one about frequency and angle vertically. But that then gave much more information than just what kind of fabric was used. They got the kind of fingerprint of the weave. And so these two paintings, for instance, you can see that the fingerprint is, this, is it propagates from one to the other. That's because the two canvases had originally been what's called roll mates. So artists a, bought a whole lot of, of, of primed fabric, and then they would cut off pieces and frame them, put them on, 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 on a frame, on a stretcher to start painting. So the next piece painting would be from the neighboring piece of fabric on the roll. So I would have the same fingerprinting from the, the, the weave. I mean, if the weave had been denser here than there, then that's something that you would find on all those pieces of fabric. And so these paintings now we know were painted probably very close to each other in time because we can look at their x-rays and look at a fingerprint in one of the, the, the colored uh, renderings and, and fingerprint in another color rendering of the uh, x-ray. So the color here is completely false, but it gives you a visual of what the fingerprint is in, in that uh, uh, in, in, in those pieces of fabric. And so it gives more information than uh, uh, was possible before. So uh, let me, so was I showing that? I'm not sure I was showing that. So let me share because I may have not shown you that. So let me return a few slides back up so that I can show. I'm so sorry. So these paintings by Van Gogh, we now know were roll mates because this is what we see in, 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 uh, in, in, one, uh, uh, in one of these fingerprints. And this is what you see in another fingerprint. And so we know that's how they fit together on that roll of fabric. Okay, so I've talked to you about these two applications in which I was not involved, but and which are completely different from the ones in which I have been involved. So to give you more examples of the way mathematics can help. And let me try to review uh, in, in, in a little bit of time, uh, the, uh, uh, an application which I have been very much involved with myself, which was a uh, collaboration with the North Carolina Museum of Art in, in, 
in in uh, here in uh, uh, in North Carolina. And um, so let me tell you a little bit about the techniques that I used before I get into it. So. Uh, as I said, I started uh, working with the Van Gogh Museum and uh, the technique I use to analyze paintings is to actually determine uh, information that exists at different scales in there. So here you have these clocks by Van Gogh and you mentioned them, if you imagine them to blur them a little bit, then remember we digitize images so we can look at the difference in, in, in numbers and then we can again visualize that difference as an image by looking at numbers that are as very small as black and very big as wider. And I have actually reversed that so that uh, the, the very small here becomes white and the very large becomes black to make it more visible. I have to, to, to enhance it a little bit, otherwise you don't see them. And what you see is that you see sharp little lines because of course, where there is middle gray here and I blur it, not much changes. There's not much there, but where I have a sharp edge and I blur it becomes fuzzier. So something that was a nice transition from light to darker gray becomes fuzzier. And so I'm starting to see that in the difference. And I can do that. Let's let's show doing that repeatedly. I can't do it and it becomes too messy if I look at the whole image. Let's do that on a little bit of, on this little red square of the image. Okay, so I look at that little red square. Here it is again. I blur and I blur again and I blur some more. Every time I've made, I have a difference. The, color here that I showed you is false color. I mean, it's just to, to bring out different gradations of, of, of difference better. So these are the successive differences. Every time I lose a bit of information, and here are these three successive differences, this information that is lost when I erase detail. And you can see that there are things that come back all over. That was an edge of the clog. And I see it in every single one of those detail images. There are other places like here in the purple little rectangles you see here, where there's not much happening at the, in the very first one, the one that is top left here, something emerges in the next one. This is the enlargement again, and it starts disappearing. So different levels of detail show up at different uh, 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 different types of detail show up at different levels. And so you can actually uh, visualize similarity and dissimilarity of paintings. And we use that. I'm not going to show that because I'm going to run out of time, but you can use that to characterize all kinds of things about the images. You can also use that information in other ways. So the, the interesting thing is that whenever I give a talk, people say, oh, if you can do that, maybe you can do something else. I mean, if you could do this particular application, I have this problem here. Maybe you can help me with that problem. And that's what happened when, when I showed uh, the, 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 the work we did on, on the Van Gogh and characterizing uh, different images, different uh, different periods of Van Gogh and so on. So Joris Dick and Kun Janssen had recently looked at a through x-rays uh, uh, in order to, which are typically used for material science, at a, a, a painting by Van Gogh in which people were very interested. It's this painting, it's really painting a patch of grass like that, but when you put it on its side and you x-ray it, they could see there was something else underneath. And they were very interested in what was underneath because it was a portrait of a woman, which Van Gogh had described in a letter to Theo Van Gogh as a painting in which he had very, very well uh, uh, managed to render an 
impression of color with a very somber palette, which was something he was trying to do at that time. Now, once he got to Paris and he met impressionists, he completely changed his style and he became exuberant in color. So it's not so unlikely that a painting that he earlier valued highly as one of his own works and which he had sent to his brother was later of no interest to him and he covered again with, with something else and he painted over it. So it became a new canvas. At, uh, so, but people were interested in, in seeing more of this painting. And so uh, that's what, what Joris Dick and Kun Janssen uh, looked at it with very powerful x-rays. And they uh, found that they could separate different elements. I mean, that was the goal of this method. Here is our scene, which was a component of the, yellow, of the, of the, uh, the red, the vermilion that Van Gogh used. Here's antimony, which was uh, uh, part of the uh, Naples yellow that he used. And so you could see a better idea of the painting. And they said, you know, we, that's this, this, we did a coloration with that. And that's what we came up with. I mean, but we're not image, uh, we're not, we, we don't know anything about the mathematics of image analysis. Maybe you can do better. And very generously, they gave us the raw data for the data cube. The first thing we noticed was that there were these funny zigzag structures. And that was because they had a problem. I mean, the X-ray source was a fixed source and the painting had to be moved a little bit every time. And there had been a problem in synchrony for doing that. And because the X-ray source was in a location that they could not revisit easily again with the painting. I mean, you can imagine that it's not easy to convince insurance companies to let you take a painting like that to an X-ray source. Um, they, they, there was a synchrony problem. And so because the thing, uh, the scanning of the painting happened in zigzag. And since sometimes the x-ray had to stop and, and then start up again, the, 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 the thing had to stop, the sled had to stop, but uh, the, the, uh, there was a synchrony problem. And that's why you have these funny zigzag uh, 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 artifacts. There are places where the uh, beam, didn't give information. And uh, so the first thing we had to do is to realign everything and not just realign, we had to, because these breaks were very, very obvious here, but there were many smaller breaks in many places. So we had to model that and correct. And that was done. Then the next thing was, well, what are these black spots in the first place? Well, what they are, are places where there was big impasto on the top of the painting and the x-rays hadn't been able to penetrate. So there are places where you have no information. No information. Well, we know how to deal with that. You have to do in-painting. And so that's what we did since in-painting had been well understood. So you, uh, we marked all those spots and we in-painted. We propagated information from the brush strokes around it to go further. And then there were the long strokes from the grass on top, the impasto of that. We marked those and we impainted. Now we had still a problem with the eye. We said, what do we do there? And art conservators told us, oh, we use the information from the other eye. Oh, well, that's easy. We could do that too. So now we had impainted all those different uh, element slides. And you could then try to color it. It turned out that the analysis misses some pigments. We don't have the earth colors. We don't have the blues. So because you have missing colors, you can't really reconstruct from that. However, we had other paintings from the same period. So let's look at that. So there were I mean, you see here, oh, I forgot to say, this is an enlargement of saying how nicely the in-painting really works with more detail. Okay, so we took other paintings from the same period. So these are two paintings, portraits from the same period that have not been overpainted, so we have them. One with almost the least contrast and one with very much contrast. And the thing is that if you do a, a color analysis, I mean, you try to find on the color wheel where things are. Well, that dark purple and, and, and shouldn't, you shouldn't take that into account where something is black 
it's it's really whether it's black purple or black brown or so on it looks black to our eyes so we should take that information away and then it turned out that these paintings were very much similar even though they don't look similar to our eye so what that meant is that we could use information from existing paintings and the partial information we had from the elements to infer and when we did that this is what we got for the reconstruction so the Im the mathematical analysis of images enabled us to go from the rendering on the left from the same data we got the one on the right so again that's a story that i that i tell people and people love and when I told it to people at the North Carolina Museum of Art shortly after I moved to Duke, they said, would you be interested in working with us? And, uh, uh, and I said, yes. And we started working together and that became the Reunited Project. So we first started, uh, so the, the Reunited Project is a, a project about the Gisi altarpiece three panels of which. So this is a 14th century altarpiece uh, in, in, uh, 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 that was early in the 20th century. Uh, uh, the church was decommissioned. It was in the Marche region in Italy and uh, uh, the altarpiece was sold and uh, it was by a dealer sewn up into panels and the individual panels were sold to different collectors. Three of them ended up in the North Carolina Museum of Art, one in Portland, three at the Metropolitan Museum, one in Chicago, and another one is missing. In fact, it's only in the, in the 60s that people realized that these were all from the same altarpiece because they're, uh, uh, the fact that they all belonged together had not remained documented in, 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 in the archive. So it's by de de comparing details of the painting that this was realized and the missing uh, uh, piece has, has never been found. The uh, people at North Carolina Museum of Art who had discovered that uh, uh, those pieces were all part of the same painting together wanted to do an exhibit, bringing them together to show to people. But the other museum said, you have one missing anyway. I mean, you won't have it complete. And he then commissioned, he thought, I, I introduced him to somebody I had worked with before, Charlotte Kaspers, and uh, who is an art reconstruction expert. Here you see her working for a museum on reconstructing a Jeroen Bos. Uh, they, asked her to reconstruct that missing panel. Now you can say a missing panel, reconstructing a painting so that people will be allowed to touch it rather than the, 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 the invaluable masterpiece and so on. You can do that, but how do you reconstruct a painting that nobody has, that we have no picture of? Well, it turned out that the little panels uh, were all, uh, uh, so we have this big altarpiece, the little panels, were all scenes of the life of John the Evangelist, as uh, shown in 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 uh, in uh, the Golden Legend, uh, in this book, uh, which must have been a medieval bestseller because we have zillions of copies of it, and they showed the different scenes in order, and so that allowed to guess what the missing scene was. Missing scene was going to be the baptism of a, 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 he, a heathen prophet who was challenging John to different feats before and who was now going to say, oh yes, I'm convinced. I believe in your God, please baptize me. And so uh, they made a composition together with the art conservator that was probable and she used elements from other paintings. You see here, she uses an element of the eighth panel to show John in the ninth panel, the new panel. And the beautiful panel resulted, beautiful, vibrant panel. And then they realized, I mean, it had been a fantastic project. They had made a documentary of how it was made. 
if they were, they were going to show this to, to visitors, they would be bowled over by how vibrant and how shiny and how bright these colors were. And there was no way they could put it next to the other. Because it was going to be such a contrast. People would have only eyes for this new shiny object. It was the only non-authentic one. So what they decided is that they uh, that we were going to age it virtually. So we took a high resolution photograph and we aged it. And then we could put the age copy next to the old panels. For that, you had to put color correspondences, put the cracks in, aged gold beadwork, and so on. And in fact, that is what we did. And this is actually, I mean, it shows more on this photograph than it did in reality, because in the flash that was used to take this photograph, the reflection properties of the paper and the, 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 the panel, the wood panel, the varnished wood panel were too different. But in reality, it, it really fooled experts until you went and looked really closely. But on another wall in the exhibition, they showed the real panel. And, uh, 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 and then they also showed the documentary. Uh, we then realized that you can also rejuvenate the old panels because what you need to do is you need to remove the cracks in paint, but we know how to do that. We map the old colors to new colors, but we already had the correspondence from new to old, so we could also go from old to new, and we had to rejuvenate the gold work. So that was uh, 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 several, several different projects. Uh, Studying and removing cracks is not an easy thing, but we had previous experience with that. We had experience with the Ghent altarpiece by Van Eyck. So that's yet another project, and let me touch very quickly on that. So this is a very, very, very famous piece painting in, 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 in uh, Ghent in Belgium. It's a polyptych, and if you close it and you look at the scene with Mary with the Annunciation on the door, you see there behind her is a book, this book here. And if I, that book, if I enlarge that, as I will show you in the next, then you see it's painted. I'm now talking about a piece of painting on this enormous polyptic that's a few five centimeters high, maybe. And if you enlarge that enough, you start seeing letters. And people wondered, did Van Eyck paint real letters? Or did he just paint uh, something that looked like writing? And there were two kind of opinions about this. And I said, well, why can't you decide? I said, well, the cracks distract our attention. I said, well, but that we can detect and we can fill in. And it was harder than I had realized. I mean, we had to work, it became part of a PhD thesis in, in, in Brussels to actually remove those cracks because it's not obvious, you see, I mean, the cracks, they don't all have the same color uh, uh, and so on, but he managed and we went from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. And I thought, well, a fat lot of good that has done to us because we still can't read that text. Well, I can't, but experts recognized many, many more words than before. And so they could identify what text this was and which they were delighted by. And uh, so they could use that in their research. But because we had done this, when we saw the cracks in the Gisky panel, I said, we can help. Math can help with this. So we found all the cracks and then they could be painted in. Let me show you here, you see on the left, cracked on the right virtually painted in and it's done gradually and we worked with the conservators and the curator to decide how far do we go i mean we did it gradually and they said okay to what you have here on the left that we accept you could go further but then it becomes uh more more guesswork than than so we filled in cracks everywhere and color remapping. Okay, so for color remapping, let's take abstraction of the gold. You see, we had examples. You saw that Charlotte used the position of 
John the Evangelist in the eighth panel to model him in the ninth panel. So we had for, and the way she knew what the pigments were had been done by chemical analysis. So she had exactly those pigments. So we knew that correspondence. So we could do a color remapping of the old ones to the new, just like we had done for the exhibition, a remapping of the fresh colors on the right to the aged colors on the left. Then we also had to be able to make cracks. For that, we actually we, we uh, took our inspiration from the cracks that existed in the other paintings. And then finally, the gilding was a separate uh, uh, issue because for the gilding, you see, these paintings had a very special gesso bottom originally. And uh, so these paintings panels had been over months prepared with very special gesso layer that was as smooth as you could imagine, really incredibly smooth. And then they would apply the gilding to that over a layer of bowl so that it could be polished with an agate. And so these, these, this was beautiful, shiny, and must have been fantastic in the churches. I mean, how these shiny uh, surfaces reflected the candlelight. And so you see that, let me share screen again here. And, and the punch marks around it uh, added luster to the aureolas of, 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 of the saints. And that is something that for that, for to model reflections like that, you really need to model it as a 3D object and, and you do rendering, uh, which gives you that 3D expression that at slight changes of reflections as you move your point of view. And the punch marks had been, we had taken the shape of them and new punches had been made, which Charlotte had used for her new version. So we could find those punch marks everywhere. And those were then used in order to do the rendering. And let me stop share here a moment because I want you to give you an impression of the rendering. We had to model the whole thing as a 3D object and do the same kind of rendering that people do to make Pixar movies. But uh, so what you then see, so let me share my screen here, was uh, uh, this is something, a little movie that we made that showed for people who came to the exhibit uh, what the panel, the best impression we could produce of what the panel must have looked like. We didn't invent anything and that's why where it was sewn, you still see high uh, gaps in the picture, but you see how this, this was uh, this beautiful, uh, shiny uh, background and these fresh, vibrant colors, which were very different from the dull ones that, 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 that were visible in the original painting. And let me stop it here because I do want to tell, tell you about Matthew Alchemy. So that was all this work about art and, and uh, mathematics for conservators and for art uh, conservation. And not only art conservation, also to give people a virtual view of the artwork as it had must have, well, as close as we can reproduce what it could have looked like originally, short of making the physical object, uh, which is something that museums don't really want to uh, do too often. Um, but I want to tell you about Mathemalchemy. Mathemalchemy is a completely different uh, 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 project in which I have been involved for the last two years. Um, and if you take this word, mathemalchemy.org, and let me start sharing screen again so that you can see that. So mathemalchemy org then you can see a lot about it but let me tell you in a few minutes about the the adventure of this creation so this is our logo and here are a number of different places where you can see videos on youtube uh, and, and and so on uh, this is the group of 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 uh, the mathem alchemists we are a group of 24 people who like art, who are, many of us are mathematicians and who have experience in crafting. Well, I'm one of the few ones who don't have experience. 
And here are objects that people have made. Uh, we have used so many different techniques. I'll come back to all those techniques. Uh, how did it start? Well, in we together with Dominique Ehrman, who's a fantastic artist, we uh, who makes big, uh, uh, she makes big, big, big uh, uh, constructions with, that use quilting and other fabric things in order to uh, uh, render some, 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 some idea. One of the works that I saw, which was bowled me, bowled me over, was one where she had a big quilt. A quilt is is a, a, a is, is something that's made out of little pieces of, of fabric, and she had this quilt, which is a two dimensional thing by almost by definition, that was absorbed by a machine and then rendered 3D figures. And so I said, well, maybe we can use that to show mathematics come to life. And uh, so, uh, sorry, this is not, okay. I need to share screen again, uh, share screen again. And I want to get out of this little movie back to Mathemalchemy. So, she and I talked about it for many, many uh, 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 meetings in the fall of 2019, and she gave me ideas and so on. And then we gave a presentation to a special session on mathematics and art. And Dominique made a little maquette, and uh, which we introduced to people. The idea was that we would have so many different aspects of mathematics shown beautiful objects it would be an artistic whole a whole installation and uh people signed up right at the meeting they were this was a meeting of mathematicians uh who are interested in making beautiful art objects and uh more uh people completed the meeting and we had many meetings where we illustrated here we saw some some uh steel welding illustrated and we explained to each other and we showed ideas we discussed we laughed out loud uh, we were sometimes skeptical and uh we built COVID. you see the first thing i, I was originally we presented this to all the other mathematicians in january 2020 and we said this is a collaborative project and we have if people sign up we'll find funding for it i did find funding and we'll have three workshops where we'll hammer out the ideas and then we'll construct things and we have to go home and work a little bit but then we come back together and we construct the whole thing and the first workshop was going to be in march of 2020 and you all know what happened in the beginning of 2020 COVID arrived and in march 2020 the united states were in lockdown and no way. We held our meeting on Zoom. And we said, are we going to do it still? And we said, yes. We decided we would go ahead and continue and build a whole lot. We would build the conception. We would hammer out the conception. And Dominique made a, a larger maquette. And then we would build many of the components in our own homes. And that's what we did from March 2020 to July 2021, we were always, uh, we had meetings first every week, then every two weeks. And when we got into, into um, fabrication, it didn't have to be as, uh, uh, um, as frequent anymore, but we, we, we showed, this was a 3D printed thing. This uh, here, we showed somebody who, who used the ceramics that were made by one person. She was making clothes for this. this in and we had incredible conversations. So we built this magical world in which uh, chipmunks are small children who are discovering when they arrange acorns in rows that if you have 12, you can make six rows of two or, or four rows of three. And if you have 13, you always have a remainder because 13, of course, is prime and 12 is not. And so we had all these funny conversations. Our, our spouses thought it was hilarious. And we built this wonderful world here, we had a ceramist making these beautiful herons. They became fishermen on, on a boat. 
uh, the fish were these uh, special knots. These are called theta knots. And the interesting thing is that you see several different colors show different knots, which together make up this, this, this more interesting construction. Uh, this was a, a knotty branch. I mean, so it shows hyperbolic surfaces and it, it's one and knots here as the appendages. Uh, um, it showed all these different uh, 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 objects, and we uh, uh, we used so many techniques. We used sewing and crochet and knitting and and uh, ceramics and sculpture and three D printing and leatherworks and wire banding and uh, polymer clay and uh, you name it. We tried using it, steel work, uh, steel steel welding, and, and so on. So uh, you should really visit mathemalchemy.org. Uh, uh, let me share it here again. Uh, mathemalchemy.org gives you a whole lot of of of. Uh, uh, its website is still changing. It is a physical object. It's as big as a room. I mean, here it is. We built it in July 21 because for a while it seemed like uh, we, we could get together again. And uh, here is a, uh, you can actually play with this. Uh, you can change your point of view. So uh, this is the 3D Mathemalchemy. And today actually, we have packed it all up. It's traveling to the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, DC, where it will be shown. And I could go on for hours, but my time is definitely up and I should stop. And so let me stop here. Bye bye. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid, for your uh, beautiful, very nice presentation. Now, maybe. I don't know if uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, questions from uh, our audience. Uh, anyway, I can start with uh, one uh, small question. I have uh, seen that you were uh, really passionate with this kind of, uh, involved in this kind of creation of uh, these yes. objects. Uh, what's the, the role of the, of the mathematician uh, to, in uh, this collaboration with artists? Uh, really, what, what's what do you are doing well, when you discuss with the, artists? The uh, so so the, the group has two thirds of them are mathematicians, but who are very artistic, who like making these beautiful objects. But there are also artists who are really passionate and, and intrigued by mathematics, and uh, and who don't necessarily know a lot of mathematics, but who are whose view of what mathematics is changed completely through the collaboration. Actually, Dominique, many of them remember mathematics from high school as boring and very stiff. And nevertheless, they were intrigued, but then they see us and the way we talk together. And it's so different from how they imagine mathematicians must talk to each other. So uh, the uh, uh, originally there, there are some silhouettes which depict mathematician. And there's one adult person. And originally, Dominique had made her very stiff. I mean, a little bit hip, but kind of stiff. And then later we said, oh, it doesn't feel right. And so by talking to us, her and now she's this flowing woman with hair flowing in the air and, and very natural, very beautiful. Uh, uh, so we laughed about that. But uh, so we wanted to have these beautiful, we wanted to illustrate mathematical ideas. But we also wanted to show links between things. So this, this, this piece is replete with uh, uh, ideas. When the mathematical artists themselves make objects, they usually want to illustrate one idea or one symmetry thing and so on. The installation has so many of them and they make stories together. Um, for instance, uh, the, the tortoise goes on a path where the pavement, half path is in pavers that are very big. And then the next quarter of the path, the pavers are, they're 14 pavers again, but they're half the size. And then the next uh, pavers are smaller again and so on. So it's Zeno's paradox illustrated in this tortoise going for a hike. But tortoise wanted to take her lunch. 
So she actually is dragging a kite in the air, and the kite is a Sierpinski, uh, uh, a, a fractal, a fractal uh, pyramid. The bakers, bakery, the bakers like to bake, ha, are making cookies with a cookie cutter that tiles, so that when you use that cookie cutter, you don't have any wasted uh, pastry. I mean, wasted dough. I mean, so wherever we could put an idea, an interesting or or a pun, I mean, we did it. I mean, so it's a magical world and it, it has so many different ideas. I mean, the website is becoming enormous because we want uh, people to be able to enjoy it. But if they want to know more, we want them to give them a point. We don't want to explain everything, but we want for each thing to give them a starter. Let's go to this Wikipedia article or that YouTube video and so on. And from there, you can, you can look for more. And... Uh, so people here, when we were building it, saying, well, when it comes back to Duke, which is planned to do in a few years' time, maybe we can make a course around it. And somebody said, well, one course wouldn't be enough to explain this. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in it. So we wanted to explain, we wanted to illustrate, we wanted to charm, we wanted... There's so many different levels at which you can interact with mathematics, and we wanted to hook up with all of them. Very interesting, and I hope to see this uh, exhibition uh, uh, really in person very soon. Well, maybe in Italy. Maybe in Italy. It, it's well, if you're interested. I mean, it is meant to be a traveling exhibit. We are yeah. booked for the first year, so we are uh, uh, booked until until uh, the summer of uh, of uh, 23. But it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can start to work uh, uh, about that. <laughs> especially in Rome. And um, also I have uh, another question from the audience. Uh, Laura Perrone is asking uh, something about uh, what uh, you are looking for as a researcher in, uh, in this, this period. What's the next uh, frontier of your re research uh, now? Well, uh, so we, uh, something on which I'm working with others is uh, uh, splitting uh, x-rays. So uh, for instance, with the Ghent altarpiece, but also some other paintings, um, paintings on panel that are painted on both sides. So you see the visual of each, but when you take an x-ray, you get both. Uh, can you, it makes it very hard to read. Our eye is so good at, and our visual system is so good at some things, but splitting things like that, we're not good at at all. And so uh, we've been asked by the conservators, can we from that make two x-rays that show what would have been the x-ray if there only were one painting on one side? And that's a very, very challenging problem, but we have made good progress. So there are a number of questions that come up naturally that are questions I would never have thought of, but that for the conservators, are natural and they're challenges for us and so that makes it very interesting and it's so much more interesting to work on those images i mean to work on van Eyck or goya or or than to work on on on, on stupid photographs and image analysis i mean uh, so so but there are other i mean there always are problems and mathematics can always help it's true and i have the questions um, essentially people Congratulating for this initiative. Also, people uh, they want to to know that uh, you are um, keeping uh, to continuing to create these installations for uh, mathematics, uh, new uh, projects for the future, or that's fixed now. Well, mathematics itself is is now done and and packed up and uh, going on the truck this afternoon. Um, but but uh, we are still working on, on finalizing the website. That will take a couple more months, I think, before that's completely done. Uh, um, and I don't know. I mean, look, sometimes grants ask me to write. Uh, I mean, it used to be uh, more in Europe than here in the States, but they used to ask to write, the, uh, uh, give me a five-year vision of what you uh, are going to do. There's no way I can do that. I mean, there's no point in my life when I look back over the last five years where I could have said, I knew five years ago that this is what I would have done. I mean, uh, maybe a, about a third of it, yes, are extensions of what I was doing five years ago. 
but there are always new things that that happen and 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 i like having a life like that i like uh responding to challenges and 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 being available for for problems and, and uh, yeah, so you discover although i must be a happy grandmother and being with my grandson is also a very new thing so it's not all mathematics in my future okay okay but anyway you are discovering what you are your research, your, your directions, uh, every day, more, more or less. Well, it does, I do learn about new things. And, and I think a very big challenge right now for young mathematicians is to uh, make sure that they are in touch with people who work on uh, these, these new developments in artificial intelligence and neural nets and where we don't really know why they are working so well as, as and i think uh, mathematicians are needed mathematical insight is definitely needed whether it's something that the mathematicians will give or people uh, engineers and computer scientists who develop the mathematics to do it that depends on the mathematicians whether they want to be part of that conversation or not but they would miss a boat if they don't yeah i agree with you very much so maybe um, here they, they told me that we have to stop here because we are beyond okay. uh, all, all the time limits. Uh, and, Sorry. Uh, um, no. Okay, we have another question. We have time for another question. Um, uh, did, did you already receive requests to verify the authenticity of artworks, uh, original versus fakes? Uh, Will this technique become more accessible over time? I see. So, uh, it's, 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 I'm so sorry for the, the questioner. It's one of my least favorite questions because, um, yes, you can use some of these techniques to help you in your assessment of uh, uh, fake versus original. But it's only going to be one little ingredient in your whole toolbox. Uh, it really is something that kind of assessment has to be done by people who are experts. Uh, it's not something that I ever would make a pronouncement about myself. I'm happy to make these mathematical tools available and for people to learn about them and to use them. But it's only one of the many, many uh, uh, different details that go in such an assessment. And it's not something on which I would assume or ever want to presume any authority. Uh, plus, uh, there's the other thing that I, I, like, I like art a lot. I, and I like it not just for what it is and its beauty and what it conveys, but also for its place within its society and so on. I, con I'm conflicted about enormous amounts of money that are involved, and I wish that were not the case. And I think many museums would prefer that not to be the case, but that's a different aspect and that speculative aspect is, I don't know that I want to be very involved with that. Okay. So sorry for a long answer, but uh, no, no, but that's a very interesting point of view, uh, not not uh, a, a, a trivial one. I mean, uh, that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, other questions are arriving, and here they say that we have uh, still ten uh, <laughs> minutes uh, to spend because uh, people are interested. Another question is: uh, um, Have you thought for mathematics to uh, involve also children? also uh, beyond the artists and mathematicians uh, in this uh, kind of practice. Absolutely. And in fact, mathematics, one of the things that we are developing are uh, physical uh, hands-on activities that are joined to the project. So uh, when it goes to museums, it will go with uh, suggestions for activity, activities from an hour to several hours with children of many different ages where they can uh, do physical things, I mean, experience some of the mathematical points that are shown. But we wanted it to be something that would make children dream. I mean, that's one of the reasons we put cute critters in it. I mean, it's also, there are also puns in there. So in the bakery, uh, where where uh, the baker is, is where there are lots of things in dynamical systems are illustrated and symmetry. 
Baker is a cat called Arnold because of Arnold's cat, if you know, of course. And uh, yeah. Arnold, as a present, got balls from his cousin, and the balls have the Schrödinger equation on it because there's also Schrödinger's cat. And uh, uh, so, so we have lots of puns like that, but they are also cute critters. And uh, we thought that would be fun for children. And, uh, and there are many activities. As I said, there are things that, that can go from elementary school level to, uh, to, to research problems in mathematics. But uh, there are many activities that we have envisaged. And part of our team is doing that, uh, making these, these packages that museums, it doesn't come with, with, with stuff to do. I mean, it comes up with, with, with explanations and curriculum. And museums can themselves with, with colored paper and scissors and, 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 and tape and so on organize these. Okay, but I'm, uh, you have some example of uh, interaction activity for children you have developed in this project. Well, uh, for instance, there's a whole lot about polyhedra. So the fact that you can make that polyhedra can be made flat. And that, that you can then actually draw a straight line on the polyhedron. And what does it do on the polyhedron when you've made it, when you've glued it? I mean, people actually study these. These are called straight paths on, on their, their geodesics in a certain set. Well, they're not in a certain set, they are geodesics. But, uh, uh, but the idea, uh, or, or make, make uh, with crochet, make surfaces that are hyperbolic and then see that you also have this notion of a shortest path and that you can have uh, uh, non-Euclidean aspects to the geometry but, and just making it. Uh, that, so they're, they're, those are examples. Uh, but we also have a whole lot of different polyhedra. We have all the Johnson, all the Archimedean, all the platonic polyhedra, and there will be a map and they can do a treasure hunt for, do you see that one and that one and, and so on. And each of them, they will be able to make also. So, okay, okay, okay. It seems uh, really fascinating. Uh, I really, I'd like to have this uh, kind of exhibition uh, in Italy very soon. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we are going to make a reservation, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, other questions are arriving now and uh, about the restoration. Uh, um, you think that uh, this solution that you are fine Found, uh, you have found that can be in contrast with the aura of the uh, masterpiece uh, in some sense. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it is a, a competition between uh, what's the history behind the uh, masterpiece. Well, no, I, 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 I don't see it in competition at all. Uh, I, I think many of the masterpieces we have, I mean, we have to be so careful with them and uh, about also what we do to them. They're physical objects that have a wonderful history and we want to be careful and we, want to, we know they're fragile. Uh, we, we, we have now problems with very well-intentioned uh, conservation efforts of the past that we have seen cause problems. So we know that there are limits to what can be done, but it, it isn't it nice to imagine that you can also get a glimpse of what it looked like through your smartphone without hurting the piece itself? I, I think it just gives you a richer view, a richer experience. And how you use that experience is, is up to you and to the people who want to use it to make to describe it to to make a virtual reality with to, i mean many things can be done with it i mean i'm not trying to say this is the way it should be looked at or this is going to take away it's it's just i view it as an enhancing rather than anything anything else okay and uh, have you tried this kind of uh... Um, research made uh, in uh, artificial intelligence to use the, uh, to explore the style of an artist, to recreate a new paintings, a new mm -hmm. artifacts, something, something like that. But, but I think if, if one is an artist, I think, which I'm not, I wish I were, but uh, I think you want to create, you want, you may, explore how other artists achieved a certain effect 
because you want to know, you want to make that effect your own and you would then to use it. So I'm not saying one does never wants to copy or to, to work in the style of somebody else. That's a useful thing. It's like when we are mathematicians and we read a paper, we want to understand how the paper work, how the mechanism of the proof, not because we're going to rewrite this proof and say, look how beautifully I can explain this proof. We just want to make it our own so that we can do things with it. So you want to create new art. I mean, uh, and so is it so useful to learn to make a, a, a drawing of one composition and then render it in a Van Gogh style? I don't know. I mean, you, get, you have programs that do that. I mean, but I feel that's not really art. That can make beautiful things that can still be beautiful decoration for your wall. I'm not saying that one shouldn't do it, but that's not what art is for me. Art for me, look, mathematics is a kind of, in mathematics, we develop a language and, and, and concepts in order to do intellectual things. They can be, they can give us joy in doing it. And, and I'm not saying that it's purely dry and cut and intellectual. And so no human emotion has part in it, but still it is a logic. Uh, art to me is something that we do because it gives us a shortcut just like mathematics gives us a shortcut in logic but art gives us a shortcut emotionally it makes it possible to have a deep interaction with others with the artists with people who experience the artwork in an emotional way and so it is very very important to all of us too uh, i don't think you get that from taking a cartoon drawing and rendering in a Vahoch way by a program. I mean, that's a different thing altogether. And I don't, I don't think that the second is ridiculous. I mean, if you like doing that, I mean, beautiful wallpaper that way, I'm sure. I mean, and we, we need to decorate ourselves. We need to decorate our houses with beautiful things, but it's not art. I mean, uh, that's my view. Okay. I've okay. Okay. By it. okay. That's Oh, that's an important view and also some insight about your view of uh, the, the, the performance of art, how people yes. produce art, new art. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that um, another question we have, what's the creativity for a mathematician? Well, I've alluded that to that already a little bit. Uh, we want to understand things and we want to uh, capture that understanding and understand more. So we learn from other mathematicians. We say, oh my God, the argument that they used in order to get from this to that conclusion, doesn't it remind you also of the argument that mathematician Y used in this completely different context from their origin, original idea to do their conclusion. And uh, others will say, well, I don't really see that. And others will say, well, maybe. And so you try to tease out what is that analogy? Can I make it precise? And sometimes you're wrong, but sometimes you're right. And making that precise and then convincing other mathematicians that this really works. And they say, oh my God, you're right. Oh, wow. That wow feeling is a fantastic feeling. It's a fantastic, it's, it's a high. I mean, I tell my students that they should, whenever they have done something like that, they should enjoy it to the hilt because uh, usually you then probe some more uh, to understand it better. And three weeks later, you see it's so obvious. Why did I have to look for that for six months? I mean, so, uh, so then the high has gone. Then you, you're kicking yourself again for being so stupid. So, but there's a moment that, that you really feel very excited. And, and it is very much about communication, telling others and, and, and then doing more with it and communicating and communicating it well enough that people see the new tool you build and use it themselves to do other things with. And so we understand so much and we build so much. I mean, we build the tools to, to, to do more mathematics and to do science. Uh, Eugenio Calabi, 
once. He was on the visiting professor, a uh, visiting uh, committee for Princeton, asked me whether I knew the difference between a, an applied and a, a pure mathematician. I said, well, Professor Calabi, I have my own opinion, but I'd love to hear yours. And he says, well, he says, a pure mathematician, and he was very much a pure mathematician, says, is somebody who, when they're stuck, they're trying to simplify the problem so that they become unstuck. He says, an applied mathematician, when they're stuck, they say, time to go to the library and learn more mathematics. Because in applied math, the problem usually dictates what kind of mathematics you have to use. And so, and usually, but that's the great thing. Pure mathematicians often have built it already. So you go to the library and learn it. Okay, okay. That's a very good suggestion for all mathematicians, <laughs> for applied mathematicians. For, uh, for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we, if we have to go to the library sometimes, yeah. Very well, these days you go to internet, but <laughs> yeah, to internet, yeah. Um, okay, um, I I'm looking for a new question. I have a the the delegation of Flanders in Rome uh, is uh, thanking you for uh, most this most inspiring talk. Greetings, uh, so for the delegation okay, of, thank you. of Flanders, and uh, you. maybe now. Um, I, I see that uh, we can stop now because uh, we finished the questions. And so, thank you very much again for your uh, inspiring talk. I, well, you're very, very welcome. Yes. Thank you for and, inviting me. And many ideas, uh, many suggestions for, uh, for new research and uh, new, uh, even exhibition. Here we are mm -hmm. in, uh, yes. inside of a mathematical artistic exhibition, so maybe, uh -huh. maybe we can try to convince the uh, Palazzo delle Esposizioni to host uh, Mathematica in uh, 2023. So that's... Uh, I'm sure all our <laughs> critics would be delighted to visit Rome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thanks to bye -bye. Our, our audience uh, to stay with us uh, this afternoon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.